are right when she tells us we should rid ourselves of outdated gender stereotypes. Not everyone is impressed. Though. Some, of course, say the government has, hasn't gone far enough to tackle unequal pay. The average pay gap figures for big businesses have to be published by the end of today, but that's not nearly enough. Others say she's barking up the wrong tree. The figures measure aggregate pay. It simply reflects that more women take time out to have children, etc. The psychologist Jordan Peterson has made quite a splash in recent times, challenging gender pay complaints. I asked him what the counter-argument was to the points the Prime Minister was making this morning. Well, the counter-argument is to be a little bit more sophisticated in your statistics. These broad-based comparisons of gender and salary are not sufficiently sophisticated to capture the variability in the data, not by any stretch of the imagination. You, you would, you'd fail a, a first-year social science student for producing a project like that. I think what the, so, prime, what the Prime Minister would say is that, yes, she understands that these are very broad sets of data, but what they describe is an experience where women going to work are in places where they're paid less, they are in atmospheres where they're paid less, their experience of life isn't as fair and equal as it should be. Yeah, well, you know, when I look at something like that, I like to look at the facts and, and not to look at arguments about how people feel about what's happening. First of all, like there's elementary reasons why men are paid more than women. For example, the first thing you'd look at if you were a statistician is, is the median salary the same? Because a few highly paid men can skew the data tremendously, and most of the people who make a tremendous amount of money are a small minority of men. And that doesn't necessarily indicate any prejudice whatsoever against women. It just means that the people who are most likely to work exceptionally long hours and to occupy positions that require a tremendous sacrifice in terms of personal life are almost always men. But then maybe so one of the answers there, on, on that then, one of the answers might be, and I, again, I'm not sure the Prime Minister would disagree with that, but she would say, well, let's do something about it. Let's make it. Let's make those top jobs different if we need to, so that women are more attracted to going into them. You can't make those top jobs more attractive because they require a certain set of skills that aren't transferable. So, for example, if you're going to occupy a top executive position, you have to be willing to work something in, on, in the neighborhood of 80 hours a week. That's all you ever do. That's your life. And that's the price you pay for running something that's incredibly competitive and demanding. And so there's only a small number of people who are willing to do that, and those are generally men. And there's all sorts of other issues that drive men in the workplace to earn more money. So, for example, men work longer hours, and so... If you work 44 hours a week, you make twice as much money as someone who works 34 hours a week. So we're going to do the stats to see who, who works longer hours. We know that male doctors work far longer hours than female doctors, for example. Now, you know, there's reasons for that. The general reason is that women have more duties on the child care front, but no one's figured out how to monetize that. Men are more likely to move to work. Men are more likely to do dangerous jobs. Men are more likely to go into STEM fields and in, in executive positions, they're more likely to take positions like sales, where the pay is higher than positions like human resources. To analyze pay by gender is a completely inappropriate statistical analysis. But you There's describe no all those things. You, you describe all those things as if they're a given. They just have to be because of differences no, no, between I'm men not, and women. They, they don't I'm, have to be, do they? And that's the point the prime minister's making. No, the point that she's making fundamentally is that there's some evidence that women taken globally earn less than men taken globally if you do the statistics badly, and that indicates that society is unfair. And it's not a reasonable point. You can't make a case that there's a gender gap when you do the statistics badly. I understand that, but a lot of people listening might be saying, I'm going to say, my, I, I experience in my own life again and again from being told at school that you're not going to be as good at maths through to all the things that happen to you during your life. Again and again, as a woman, I'm told, and I live an experience where I have fewer opportunities. And then I look at the gender pay gap, and it does exist on aggregate. And I think, well, that's another thing that holds me down. Look, if people want to use bad information to generate social policies that are going to be problematic, that's up to them. But it's going to cause a tremendous amount of trouble because the reality of the situation is that you can't take a complex multifactorial phenomena like wage differential and reduce it to a single variable, no matter how much you want to or how much it makes you feel good. Jordan Peterson, thank you very much.
12 minutes. Hi there, and welcome to Mental Trainer Podcast. For non-Norwegian listeners, the Mind Coach podcast that you also can find on iTunes. My name is Frank Nilsson. I'm the founder of the non-profit nomorefear.no. I'm also the co-founder of mentalfitonline.no. I had a life-changing event back in 2011 when I experienced panic attacks for over four months. And since that time, I've been working as a mind coach for professional athletes, CEOs and entrepreneurs. And I've been really devoting my life to bring awareness and solutions about an anxiety. That is what I'm passionate about. And that's the reason I started this podcast this summer. And since then, I've talked to Norwegian pole explorers, famous Norwegian artists, world champions in rock climbing, 40 times Guinness record holders in breaking stones, and famous Norwegian art- authors. To share their stories, their strategies talk on fear, how they motivate themselves, and much more. In the first international episode a while back, I talked to James Bruman. He ran across Australia in 82 days by himself, just to have fun. He has also cycled from Alaska to Argentina in two years. He has base jumped, been to Mount Everest, and much more. You can check that episode out on the Mind Coach podcast on iTunes. Now, in this second international podcast episode, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. Dr. Jordan B. Peterson is a cl- clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. He pre- previously served as a professor at Harvard University. Dr. Peterson has become a YouTube phenomenon with his lectures that has been seen by millions of people all over the world. If you haven't seen them, check it out. He is the author of the book Maps of Meaning, the Architecture of Belief. He has also authored or co-authored more than 80 academic research articles on a wide variety of psychological topics. And is one of the team behind the online program self altering Now, to the episode. Some of the topics we talk about is how we as human beings see the world through our map of the world. How important it is to constantly update this map and keep breaking out of our comfort zone. How we see different solutions based on our personality type. And why stories like The Hobbit is powerful and much, much, much more. There is just one thing to say and that is enjoy. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. You said something in the Joe Rogan podcast, Jordan, that really caught my attention. Yeah. And you said that uh, memories that is reoccurring, that is more than 18 months old, we don't have a solution for. We haven't found a solution for it. Yes. And yes. What- I, when, I, when I heard that, I was, it really caught my ears. I went, what? What is he saying now? Can you please elaborate on that one? Sure. Well, obviously. If, if, if something occurs in your life and it, it has emotional significance, it beca- it's because it has some kind of implication either for how you should act or how you should think about how you should act. So, for example, if you're arguing with someone and they want you having a dispute with them, they generally want you to do something different or they want you to think about the world in a different way. But that's still related to action. So emotion, especially negative emotion, tends to signify that something about the way you're conceptualizing the world or yourself or the way you're acting is incorrect. Otherwise, it wouldn't have a negative outcome, right? Because when you act in the world, you're always trying to essentially to get what you want and also to validate your your viewpoint. Mm. If if something, if a negative emotion occurs, it means that you made an error of some sort. Mm. You call it a prediction error, or or you could call it a strategic error. And your mind is set up, your brain is set up so that strategic errors are in some sense intolerable. And the reason for that is that you don't want to repeat a mistake. And so your brain will tag an error with negative emotion and then obsess you with it until you figure it out. Oh, so for people that haven't figured it out, have figured out the solution. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, that that's the thing. And so so you can think about it another way. You can think about it in terms of how an animal maps out a territory. So what an animal wants is for everything it does in a territory to have the outcome that, e- that it either predicts or desires. It doesn't want anything to go wrong. And if something goes wrong, it means that some of the territory isn't mapped properly. Now, the map is partly a representation of the territory, but also a partly a representation of how to act there. Mm. And so you can imagine imagine something like fire. You, you have to cope with fire as a human being. 
you can avoid it or you can master it. Either way, what you've done is you've adjusted your behavior to the demands of the situation so that the outcome that you want occurs. Now, your mind keeps track to some degree of how much of your territory is properly mapped. And territory can be past or present or future. And the, the more of your territory that isn't mapped properly, the more stress you experience. See, because your brain assumes that, like, if you're surrounded by things that you don't understand, mm. you will produce a lot of the stress hormone cortisol. Yeah. And cortisol activates you physiologically so that you're prepared to do whatever's necessary in the next moment. Mm. It's like an emergency preparation chemical in some sense, or it starts the cascade that produces emergency preparation. Mm. And the problem with that is it's very, very physiologically demanding. That's why people talk about such things as being burned out. Yeah. You know, so if the stress accumulates to 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 too high a degree, and the activation demands on you become too great, then you start to break down psychophysiologically. It damages your brain. It makes you old. That's what cortisol is. <laughs> and so, yeah. okay, and that's a long answer to the question. But what that what Very important means, one, extremely important well, one. what it means is that if there's part of your past that's still unmapped, mm. so it'll still be processed by the emotions that produce by the by the brain and mind areas that produce negative emotion. And so, if you have a memory and it produces negative emotion, it means you haven't mapped the territory properly. And as far as your brain is concerned, you're liable to make the same mistake again. Uh. So you, when when something negative happens in the past. Essentially, what you have to do is a causal analysis of it. Mm. And causal analysis is what it is that you did that increased the probability that that would occur, mm. or what precautions you failed to take, or what elements of your worldview are incorrect. And then you have to figure out what you would do in the future to minimize that risk. And the program that we developed which is part of the self-authoring program, there's a part of it that helps people write an autobiography. Mm. And that helps them identify the parts of their past experiences that are still tagged with emotional information and then to write and think them through. Mm. And the, the research indicates, this is mostly research that was done by someone named James Pennebaker at the University of Texas at Austin. He, he did most of the research on writing about the past. And he showed that it can produce quite dramatic health improvements. And that I understand because then it lower your cortisol so the immune system rises up again. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Well that's right. It's because if you're if you're stressed and you produce cortisol, then cortisol suppresses your immune system, among many other things. Mm. Because your body assumes that if you're in a state of emergency crisis, which is the case if you're facing something that's negative or complex, that there's no sense wasting energy on long term immune responses. Does that mean uh, yep. uh, if you if you have this uh, pattern, this reoccurring pattern, because we haven't uh, ended or find a solution for um, something that happened twenty years ago when we was little, then th that means that we're taking this pattern into adult age. Yeah, well, uh, it, it means before that it before means we find a solution for it. Yeah, well, it sort of means, in some sense, it means that you're taking a hole in your map forward into the future. Well, what often happens, for for example, a powerful ne negative memories can be can be formed when someone encounters someone who's really out to harm them. So many people develop post tra traumatic stress disorder because they've encountered something 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 malevolent, mm. something that really wishes harm, and sometimes they can encounter that within themselves. That often happens to soldiers mm. because soldiers generally develop post-traumatic stress disorder because of something they've done rather than something that's happened to them. You said something in one of your lectures about uh, trauma traumatic uh, incidents. And uh, you produced an example uh, about a rat, that a rat can scream for two days if you smell a cat. Yes, exactly, yes. And that, can, you, can you say a little bit about that? I want to ask a question after you, told it, after you said that example, if you can. Well, sometimes with my clinical clients, for example, they've, they've encountered someone who wants to hurt them. And in fact, I had one client, for example, who was frightened into 
really literally frightened into three years of quasi epileptic seizures because of the look on her boyfriend face boyfriend's face now she was a very naive person her parents had taught her literally that adults were angels and she believed that literally they taught her that and she believed that everyone was intrinsically good and then she met someone who actually wanted to do her harm and what happened